Have your Bibles. Turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 16. And before I start into the message, I want to, uh, to share something with you. And I'm very serious about this. Um, last uh, Sunday morning, um, I, I knew that I was going to be flying out to Dallas last week. And I had some uh, uh, ministry uh, out, out there at uh, Gateway in Dallas, Texas. And um, I knew that I was supposed to ask the congregation to pray for me. And I didn't do it. Because I didn't want it to, I didn't want you to know I was going to be gone. Because if you know that I'm gone, some of you, you miss church uh, when you know the pastor isn't here. And I didn't want it to affect church attendance Wednesday night. And uh, the reason why I knew I was supposed to uh, ask you to pray, I knew spiritually, in my spirit, I knew there was one leg of my flight that there was going to be a little bit of difficulty in. And I didn't know what it was. It wasn't, I didn't sense that it was life threatening, but I knew that I needed prayer. And I had asked a couple of intercessors to pray as, as I went on the flight, but uh, I was to the last leg. I was at, a, a, at Atlanta Thursday night. I was supposed to land in Charleston uh, at 11 o'clock Thursday night. And uh, beautiful weather in Atlanta. We flew out of Atlanta, and we got to Charleston. We circled Charleston, and they said, the weather is so bad in Charleston. There's an eighth of a mile visibility, big snowflakes. We cannot land. We're going back to Atlanta. So they flew us back to Atlanta. We were there for probably another two hours. Another crew came in from Los Angeles and said, we're going to fly, go ahead and fly you in to Charleston. And we landed at Charleston at about 2.20 a.m. that morning. I got home about 3.30. But I remember thinking this is why I was supposed to ask the congregation to pray. Charleston's iffy coming in anyway, you know. Well, anyway, the wind's blowing and the plane's doing this number as we're coming in. I'm thinking, oh, Jesus, just touch the pilots. God, just touch the pilots, Lord. And I mean, we, we are doing this until we hit the ground. And I didn't care if we were on all the wheels or not. I just wanted on the ground. So we finally hit the ground. And, we, and as we hit the ground, I felt ice slide, grab hold, slide, grab hold. Then finally, I felt the, the, uh, the, the turbines kick backwards. And I'm thinking, well, praise God, we made it. And I made up my mind, I'll not do that again. And, and if the Holy Spirit tells me to ask you to pray for me because I've got a trip coming up, I'm going to ask you to pray for me. You better not miss church. We, we have to, now get a hold of this. We have to uh, have the understanding. We are family here. And when the family gets together, we get together. And if one part of the family isn't there, it doesn't mean that we stay home. And, and I'm going to tell you up front right now, I'm going to be making another trip to, to Dallas on February 14th. I'm, I'm going out there for... Uh, some um, uh, mini uh, freedom ministry training. We're trying to get this ministry back here to Maranatha, and God dealt with our heart about that. And when I was out there this past week, the, the staff at Gateway thought I needed to be out there, and they're going to fly me out there and take care of everything. It wasn't something I had planned, but you better be at church on February 14th and then go to Valentine's dinner. No, I, I, come on, now, just lighten up. Don't forget we're having our... Uh, uh, what is that? Uh, share the love dinner next Sunday, and today they need to buy their ticket. You, you don't want to miss that because my wife and I are going to be speaking. I'm just kind of add-on. She's the one you really want to hear. We're going to be talking about the five love languages. You really don't want to miss that, so please sign up for that. Are you at 1 Kings 19? All right. I want to talk to you this morning about marketplace ministry. Marketplace ministry. I'm sorry, marketplace anointing. Marketplace anointing. Do you realize that God wants his anointing on you in the place where you work? I want to talk to you this morning about the call of God on your life and how God wants to use you. Let me start out with a question. Is the anointing of God reserved for the pulpit? We believe, many times we believe that those in ministry should be elevated above other ones because of the anointing that we see on their life. But the next great revival in our nation will not come because of a bunch of platform preachers. I believe that the next great outpour of the Holy Spirit, the, great, the next great revival will come from you. As, you, as it spills out of you, the, men, the anointed men and women of God making a difference in the marketplace. It isn't about whether you like where you work. It isn't about whether or not you like your boss. 
It's about being in a place that God can put his anointing on you and use you as an effective voice to advance the kingdom of God in the marketplace where you have influence. God wants to use you to advance his kingdom, allowing the Holy Spirit to use you to affect people that no preacher could reach. Do you realize that you can reach people that I never could reach? Why? Because you have influence with them, I don't. In 1 Kings 19, verse 16, God is speaking to the prophet Elijah. Also, you shall anoint Jehu, the son of Nimshi, as king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel Amola, you shall anoint as prophet in your place. God said, go anoint two people. Anoint a king and anoint a prophet. The king represents governmental leadership. It represents uh, wor the world leadership. It rec represents secular job working. Then he says anoint a prophet. That, that is recognized as ministry, as church. It's recognized as church leadership, as ministry leadership. But notice both are anointed from the same source. Notice there isn't a different source of the anointing. There may be different uh, qualities of anointing as to what each one is called to do, but it's from the same source. In other words, the same anointing that anoints the preacher is the same anointing that anoints the doctor or the manager. We're on the same page. The anointing is supposed to be on you. Say this with me. The anointing is for me. Say it again. The anointing is for me. Get that in your spirit. Get comfortable with that. Get comfortable with the aspect that God wants to place his presence on you to anoint you to advance his kingdom in your workplace. Just put your hands together and thank God right there and let me know that you all are awake. What is the anointing? I shared a little bit last week as I spoke about the anointing. But then I want to talk about marketplace anointing. The anointing means to smear. It means to paint over or to rub in. The anointing marks someone that they are set apart unto God's use. The anointing fills the gaps. It fills the defects in your life. It fills, makes up for the deficiencies that you have that you look good anyhow. That you can look so good when God's anointing is on you, people will look at you and say, man, you're amazing, but you know it's God's anointing, not you. So the anointing fills, it fills the gaps. The, the anointing is God's power-filled presence upon us for ministry. It's the anointing on our lives that is capable of bringing a lost and dying world into an encounter with Jesus Christ. Now get a hold of this. In the New Testament, every time the, the word anointing is used, it's always associated in conjunction with the Holy Spirit. You cannot have the anointing without the Holy Spirit today. You can't separate them. They come together. If you're asking for God to anoint you, it's the Holy Spirit that's going to settle down upon you to anoint you. Can somebody say amen? Jesus said in Luke 4, 18 and 19, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Lord. In other words, Jesus is saying that he places his anointing upon us to accomplish tasks. Yes. There will be some task you will face in your life that you do not have the wisdom, know-how, or ability to accomplish yourself. You will need the anointing of the Holy Ghost to come upon you to accomplish that. In John 16, 13, it says the Spirit guides us into all truth and reveals the future to us. So in other words, the Holy Spirit comes upon us to reveal all truth and to guide us in all truth. To reveal the future to us. In 1 John chapter 2, 26 and 27, get a hold of this. These things I have written to you concerning those who try to deceive you. But the anointing which you have received from him abides in you. And you do not need that anyone teach you. But as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things. 
things and is true and is not a lie. And just as he taught you, you abide in him. The anointing teaches us concerning all things. Sometimes in your life, you'll have people leave you. You'll have mentors leave you. You have trusted voices that you used to go to leave you. It's okay. Just make sure you have the Holy Ghost because He will teach you concerning all things. When the anointing of God comes upon you, He teaches you all things. When the anointing is on you, you will know how to do things you really don't know how to do. There's sometimes, I know this may seem strange, but there will be some time in your life something is going to hit you. You're going to have a solution for something, and you don't even know how you got it. It's the anointing coming upon you to teach you all things. And your boss is going to look at you and say, how did you know that? Just let him promote you. Because God's trying to get you to a higher place. Because he wants his men and women of God. Oh, he wants his men and women of God in leadership roles where he can advance his kingdom. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll hit more of that in a minute. The anointing in Isaiah 10, 27 comes upon us to destroy yokes. To destroy the things that bind and hold us back. It's the anointing that comes up. Listen, the church needs the anointing. The church needs the anointing. But I'm fearful that if the Holy Spirit was to remove his anointing, 90% of all churches wouldn't realize it for months. Because we have grown so accustomed to doing things the way we want to. And when we don't get the response we want, we sing a different song. Or we do this, or we adjust that. When the anointing of God's on you, you don't need to adjust anything. It's just the Holy Ghost. We can build churches, successful churches in the aspect of numbers and money and be absent of the Holy Ghost. If that's what today's church is, I don't want it. I want the Holy Spirit. I want the anointing of God every time we assemble ourselves together. And when we're not together, I want the anointing of God to flow through every individual in the workplace. Listen, we need the anointing in here, but it's equally important that the anointing is out there. I want the anointing of God on every person as they work in the workforce. We need the anointing of God for the task and the calling that has been given to us. I told you that Jesus taught us that the anointing is upon us to accomplish tasks. To accomplish the the callings of God that's been given to us in here, but also individually out there. The anointing of God is for the preacher and the sales clerk. The anointing is for the singer and the banker. The anointing is for the business owner. It's for the teacher. It's for the stay-at-home parent. It's for the janitor, the laborer, and 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 the lawyer. The anointing of God is for the doctor. My goodness, why would you ever want to go under a knife of some surgeon and not pray for the anointing to be upon him? We should take life a little more serious in the aspect that we need to be praying for our doctors. And if you have a legal issue, don't just go go get some lawyer that you don't know. Get a lawyer that you know is saved by the grace of God and filled by the Holy Ghost of God that they're anointed to do battle on your behalf. Yeah, can somebody just put your hands together and let me know you're still alive this morning. This is good preaching this morning. The anointing isn't just for in here. It isn't just reserved for the ones up here. Tell your neighbor the anointing's for all of us. Listen, I have to prepare myself to be up here. I don't take this lightly. A, a lot of people, I shared this in the nine. I hope Jay doesn't get mad again. If not, yeah, he'll be all right. I'll buy him a hoagie or something. He'll be okay. <laughs> I pick on Jay a lot, but he knows my heart. You know, a, a lot of people just think this just comes se- second nature to me. Sometimes, my, 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 sometimes um, they, when I say they, it just means they and don't even ask who it is or who it isn't. But they'll just try to fill my schedule up. And I think, when am I supposed to study? 
you know, I'll, I'll set it, I, I try to set every fourth week aside as, a, as a, a study planning week. I need that physically, but I also need that spiritually. I try to take a, the fourth week off as just a planning week. I, I'll be honest with you, I need more rest now than I did before I had the heart attack. I don't like it. I think I should still just be able to go as hard as I did when I was 25 years old. But there's some things that's changed inside of my body. I can't go that hard that, that long anymore. And I, I need more rest. I, I, I didn't get out of bed yesterday until 8.30 in the morning. That, that, that just gets under my skin because I'm, that's not who I am. But my body was just wore out from all that traveling and flying. Traveling used not to affect me at all. But I prepare myself to be up here. And, and every time I try to begin to prepare, there's always things that come up. I wasn't even going to come in the office on Friday after getting in late. I was just going to study from the house, but all my study material was in the office. So I, I went ahead and ate breakfast. I came in a little bit late. And as I did, every staff member that was there, half of them aren't even there on Friday, every staff member there wanted to come in, talk about the flight, wanted to come in, talk about this, talk about that. And then my associate pastor, Jay Arn, he comes to the door with that goofy-looking little grin on his face that only Jay can give. And he comes in. He said, how you doing? I'm doing good. Working hard? I'm trying. Busy? Yes. I'll just take a minute. And he lied. He took more than a minute. We sat there. Now, some of it was my fault because we got into a conversation. It probably lasted about 20 minutes. My point is this, is that every time you try to prepare yourself in a greater degree for ministry, there will always be things try to come and distract you. Not bad things, good things. And sometimes you'll need to give your attention to them, but it doesn't keep you from preparing yourself for what God has for you. I prepare myself to be here. I pray for you. I say, God, what is it that you want your people to know this week? How, do you, how would you lead me this week, God? I ask for your anointing. I, I, Father, I pray that you would help me to preach under the anointing, inspiration, and unction of the Holy Ghost with the passion of Jesus Christ upon me. Why? Because you deserve it. You're worth it. He said so. Why would you not want an anointed, prepared vessel in front of you? So let me turn, turn things around. Why would you not want to prepare yourself for your influence in the workplace? If you expect me to do it, if you want a Holy Ghost-filled word, why would you not equip yourself for the workplace? It's just as important. It's the same kingdom, same anointing. But we want to be recognized in here. Let me tell you something. God may not anoint you to use you in here. He may anoint you to use you in the hospital. Oh, man, I could, just, I could just lay into that right there. Take your place of influence serious and use it for the kingdom of God. I'm not talking about Bible thump people. Don't do that. I'm just talking about how you treat people, how you love people, how you treat your boss. And how you talk about them after they've made a decision you don't like. See how I slipped that in there? Let me tell you, it affects the anointing. When, when, when the boss makes a decision, you don't like it, and you begin to talk about the boss, what happened? The anointing, whoop, it's gone. Well, I don't believe that. Let me tell you something. Peter excused himself from the discipleship program because he denied Jesus because of his words. Jesus said, you'll deny me three times. Oh, no, Jesus, I'll go to death with you. Before the rooster crowed, did you, uh, Peter denied him three times. And after Jesus' resurrection, he told Mary, what was it that Jesus said? He said, go tell my disciples and Peter. Giving the indication that there was something wrong there between the influence of discipleship and Peter. And when Jesus stands before Peter, when he sees him after the res resurrection, what's he calling? Simon. The name given to him by his biological father, not the name given to him by Jesus. Giving us the indication that because of his words, because of his denial, he took himself out of the equation of discipleship. Thank God, Jesus said, that when you've come to yourself, 
and he got back in. There's always hope. But my point is this. You can take the anointing of God off of your life because of your words or the way you talk or who you talk about. This is serious stuff. But this is how we can maintain the anointing of God upon us. Ask your neighbor, how are you talking about your boss? Jesus, as he carried his cross. Yeah, go ahead and laugh. Get that, get that over with. Jesus, as he carried his cross, he traveled through the Via Della Rosa. The Via Della Rosa is the workplace. The Via Della Rosa is the business establishment. We were there a little over a year ago. I was amazed at how narrow some of it was. We literally walked the, the walk of the Via Della Rosa that Jesus walked to the crucifixion. And I was amazed of the marketplaces and the businesses and, 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 and the school district that was there. And, and we ate at a restaurant right on the Via Della Rosa. Jesus didn't hide as he carried the cross. He carried it through the workplace. We have all kind of crosses in the churches, but what about the workplace? We need people that will be steadfast and true to the call of God and carry the cross, die to themselves daily and carry their cross through the marketplace. We think it's all reserved for church. We don't reserve anything. We live and breathe it every day, baby. We don't reserve it. We don't hold back. We don't wait for the assembly together. We live Jesus Christ, Holy Ghost filled, every day of our lives on the workplace. It isn't enough just for church. God has given us the health and the understanding and wisdom to carry what he's given us into our places of influence. This is good preaching this morning. I'm teaching you the fundamentals of walking with Jesus, what really matters. So carry your cross. Let me ask you a question. Are you a Christian? Let me, get, let me ask you a better question. Are you a follower of Jesus Christ? See, I, I believe there's a difference. A lot of people call themselves Christians, but are we a follower of Jesus Christ? And do the people in your place of influence know that you're a follower of Jesus? Or are you one of those closet Christians? Again, I'm not talking about Bible thumping people. I'm not talking about being arrogant, and so holy that no one can touch you. But I will tell you this people are watching you. People are watching you how you live your life. You talk a little bit about church and they begin to watch you and see if it really lines up. I remember when I was working in the secular workforce, I was, I was uh, working in a paper recycling mill. I was making real good money and, and I'd, uh, I'd been saved for probably about 10 years. Uh, I'm sorry, I'd been saved probably for about five years at that time. And, and I, everything, and, and let me tell you something, when I got saved, when I was 21 years old, by God's grace, when I got saved, man, I've lived every day of my life to the best of my ability for Jesus. Not perfect, but I've done my best to live for him. And I remember being on that workplace, and every time all of us, we'd sit down to eat lunch together, and every time we'd sit down, I'd bow my head and pray. I wouldn't pray out loud and make a big scene. I'd just bow my head, I'd pray, and I'd get up, and I'd grab my sandwich. And one day, I had a lot on my mind. I don't know what was going on. I just started eating my sandwich. And one of my friends said, hey, he said, hey, Darren, something wrong with you? I said, no, I'm good. Why? He said, well, he said, you didn't pray before you took your first bite. And I'm thinking, my. and I felt like I was about this tall. Because I missed one small thing in the eyes of the people I influenced. And was it that big of a deal in the scheme of things? No, but he noticed. My point is, people are watching us. They're watching the look on our face. They're, 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 uh, so, some of you, you've talked about me. You, you've talked about me in certain situations, and when I say certain things, you look over at other people that's talked with you about, talked with you about me just to see what their reaction is. Listen, this is my first rodeo. I know how it goes. Just to see what kind of response they're going to get. Listen, it isn't about me. It's about the kingdom of God. Stop doing that to the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is the most important thing on the face of the earth. Do we realize that when we put our mouths on one another, we're not hurting them. We're hurting the kingdom of God. 
It isn't about me. It is not about you. It's about Jesus Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords. And when we talk bad about one another, it's defaming his name. My goodness. Go ahead. Just give God praise and act like you like that this morning. The anointing of God is not limited to this environment. That thought will limit the power of God. But everything that we do and everywhere we go, we must carry that anointing. Every time the food truck leaves this property, it must have the anointing on it. Why? Because it's king to business. Every time we play basketball in that kids league up there, we must have the anointing of God on that Saturday. Every time you sell a car, you must have the anointing on you. Every time you manage your department, you must have the anointing. Every time you clean the bathroom, every time you change your baby's diaper, bless God, you need to have the anointing of God on you to do it in excellence, to advance the kingdom of God. That's the severity of what I'm preaching to you this morning. Regardless of who you are, where you work, what you do, we must have have the anointing of God upon us in the working place. Why? Because souls are at stake. The advancement of the kingdom of God is at hand. It's about His presence. And when you carry His presence into the workplace, into the secular, the anointing attracts. The anointing makes you beautiful, even when you do need help. I mean, and I ask permission to do this. I mean, look at Daniel up here. I mean, he's got hair growing from every possible place on his head. And he has so much hair, he has to have it pulled back sometimes. But man, he stands up here. And some of you have thought, man, why didn't Pastor say something to him about his boots? Because that's who Daniel is. Why didn't Pastor say something about his hair? Because that's who Daniel is. I'd say something to you if you were trying to be like Daniel, but I'm just saying if, if you were really you, I'm just going to, by God's grace, let you be really you and watch the anointing of God flow through you. But every time that man, every time that man that has hair all over the place, braided, pulled back, this, that, in a man bun, I don't understand that, but in a man bun, as soon as he opens his mouth, you just sense the anointing. And he becomes the most beautiful person on the platform. What is that? Who is that? It's the anointing of Almighty God, and it attracts. And when you release that in the workplace, it attracts to God, not you. It attracts to God. Oh, it makes you look good. But it's really God doing it. Listen, the majority of the miracles that Jesus did in his lifetime was not done in, in the church. They were done in the workplace. In fact, show me one miracle that he did in the church. I mean, even the lame man that was healed at the gate outside the church, that was about as close as it got to inside the church. I'm not saying there won't be miracles inside the church, but what I am saying is that there can be miracles on the outside as well if we just keep that anointing flowing through us. The anointing is applied to enhance what you're already gifted to do. If you can sing, if you can play a guitar, his anointing on your gift, that's heaven. He's, he, just think if his anointing was on you to sell, to build, to figure solutions on the CEO of a company or, or to administrator, to counsel. His anointing on your gift. That's kingdom operation. And I don't care what kind of job you have, it doesn't matter. Just keep that anointing on your gift. In 1 Samuel 16, Jesse brings his seven sons to Samuel to be anointed. The prophet Samuel shows up and he says, hey, he said, God wants to anoint one of your sons as king and I just need to figure out which one it is. And he brings his seven sons before Samuel and Samuel said, it isn't any of these. And he said, do you have any more? And he said, yes. He said, I have one more. He said, where is he? Out in the workplace. You missed it. Where is he at? Out in the workforce. He was a shepherd. He didn't work inside the church. He worked out in the field, keep taking care of his dad's sheep. And it was outside in the workforce that he learned how to play that harp and sing praise songs to God. It was through the trials and tribulations of every day that it welled up on the inside of him. That's where he got his anointing was in the workforce. That's where he used it was in the workforce. And look at verse 11. The man of God said, we will not sit down until he gets in here. I believe that today's workforce is standing at attention waiting for the anointed workforce to show 
show up. Why? Because the kingdom of God to be in operation. Listen, the world is not going to change because of a bunch of platform preachers, but it will change when the anointing of God hits your life and you allow it to flow through you to your place of influence. I don't care. I don't care if you make sandwiches, if you're in management or a brain surgeon. Make sure you have the anointing of God on your life. I don't care if you make biscuits and tutors. And I'm not making light of anything. I don't care what you do. Make sure God's anointing's on you. If you will prove yourself faithful in a small thing, do you realize that place that you work can, can uh, be bountifully blessed financially and in every way simply because you work for them? And sooner or later, they're going to recognize they're blessed because of you. And they may overlook you a few times, but you just stay faithful to where you are and what God's called you to do. Sooner or later, it's going to come to you. Let me, let me put it this way. Here in this scripture, David was anointed as king. But 22 years later, he actually stepped into his appointment as king. He was anointed at one place, but appointed at different times. Sometimes our anointing and your appointing doesn't line up. Sometimes it's different times. Tell your neighbor, it may not be your time yet. But the key is just stay faithful to God and what he's called you to do. Let, let, let me tell the story that, that God dealt with my heart about, and I wrote this while I was on an airplane this week. And let me describe this to you, talking about a Thanksgiving turkey. Is that okay? You remember this message because I'm going to talk to you about a Thanksgiving turkey. Thanksgiving turkey. You select the Thanksgiving turkey. You pick it out because it's the right size and the right weight. You base that on how many is going to be at your house. You select that turkey because you know it will fill your family. Remember last week how I taught you about how the anointing fills? Well, you will buy that turkey. It becomes anointed when you pick it out, when you destine it to be on your Thanksgiving dinner table because it's going to fill your family or the emptiness that's in your family. Can somebody say amen? But it's anointing and appointing is not at the same time. It's anointed when you pick it out. That's going to fill my family. But the time of its appointing is different. It goes through a process. It goes through a, a molecular breakdown, if you will. It has to be thawed. It has to be acclimated with a, with, with a uh, workable temperature to where it can be utilized. And then some things are taken out of the turkey. Thank God things are taken out of the turkey. But then some things are placed back in the turkey. To affect its purpose and its seasoning, its taste. You put seasoning on it, put stuffing in it, and then you expose it to intense heat. Why do you expose it to intense heat? To bring the internal temperature up to a safe place. This is good stuff. And you know that when, that, when, when, the, when the safe place has come, when that little red button pops up, when that little red button pops up, the anointing and the appointment has arrived at the same time. Let me ask you a question. Has your button popped yet? And everybody knows you're anointed. But has your button popped yet? Has your, inter <laughs> has your internal temperature come up to a safe place? Because you serve that bird before it's appointed time. It'll make everyone who eats it sick. It'll do more damage than good. And the sad fact about church today is, is there's been too many people try to step into their appointment just because they were anointed. And it's made the church sick. Because we saw what we wanted. We knew what we were called to do. But we wanted to achieve it before God actually brought it to us. Let me tell you something, child of God. When God has anointed you and he's appointed you for a certain time, you don't have to labor for it. You don't have to strive for it. You don't even have to jockey for it. When his appointment is time, when it lines up, he will bring it to you. And all you got to do is just step into it. But the problem comes is when we want to make it happen. Because we know we're anointed. 
We know what we can do. And we try to step into it prematurely. And it causes, it affects uh, unhealth through every, throughout everyone around us. Until the appointment lines up with your anointing. Listen, just stay faithful to God. It doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter what you're doing. Just stay faithful. Keep the anointing of God on your life. Listen, the anointing is the anointing. The same anointing that's on the pastor is the same anointing on the salesperson. Some of the greatest pastors are not in his churches. They're in the workplace, both male and female. I, I, I can think, of, I can think of, of, of one business owner right now that is an extremely great pastor. That, that he does things that, that I don't know that very many business owners do. That when there's a death inside, and I don't know how many, I would say he probably has close to 100 employees, that whenever there is a death of someone in his family that works for him, he makes sure he's there at, at the funeral. There's times that he'll go visit his uh, employees in the hospital. A business owner's not required to do that. But he has a pastor's heart, and he does it because he's called, because he knows the kingdom of God is operating in his life. And the business is not his primary focus. The kingdom is his primary focus. See, when you're a business owner or when, when you're an employee, you just look for opportunities to advance the kingdom. And if you advance the kingdom, God will advance the business. I pray that makes sense. Let me, I'll, I'll, let me just finish with this. Let me ask this question. I want to talk to you if you fit this category. How many of you are in full-time ministry? I want you to stand up if you're in full-time ministry. If you're in full-time ministry. 99% of you just missed everything I preached to you. I'm going to give you one more opportunity. How many of you are in full-time ministry. Come on. Now go ahead and give God praise. I'm thankful you're finally beginning to realize who you are. <clears throat> and while you're on your feet, I want to do something this morning. I want to ordain you into your anointing, your call of God on your life. I want to ordain you. Ordination means that there's a time of recognition on your life. A time where you recognize who you are in the kingdom, but it's a time where others around you recognize who you are in the kingdom. And that's what today is all about. And I want to ordain you into your time of ministry, into your call of God. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that the anointing of the Most High would flow through every fiber of these individuals' beings, God. I pray you would strengthen them and equip them, God. I pray you would empower them to, to uh, accomplish exploits that's far beyond themselves, Father. I pray you would overshadow them with your presence. I pray you give them wisdom all the days of their life. Father, I pray that you would awaken the God-given dream that you've placed on the inside of them, God. It would not be old news, but I stir it up today, God, with the, with the power-filled words of your presence. I stir up those dreams today and call them back to life. I pray you give them ideas, innovative ideas. I pray you give them a boldness, God, to speak what the king says to speak. But also, Father, may they be submissive to submit themselves to the ones that you placed over them. And, Father, may you connect them to the right people, the right place at the right time to advance your kingdom. Lord, I stir up the gifts of God within them that you've placed there. Now, if every one of you would repeat after me, I am anointed. I will not fail. I am blessed. I am saved. I am free. I am forgiven. In Jesus' name. Now you give God praise and celebrate Him for ordaining you this morning. And let me, let me remind you. Let me remind you of something this morning. That you're anointed to accomplish God's kingdom on the face of this earth. But there will be times you'll be faced with situations that you don't recognize and you don't know what to do with it. I remind you of 1 John 2, 27. But the anointing which you have received from him abides in you, and you do not need that anyone teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things. 
just let him teach you. When you don't know, when you're not sure, don't move. Just begin to pray. Just get that anointing flowing. In the morning when you get up and you sit down with Jesus and you begin to pray and open up the book, the anointing starts flowing. Well, I I don't always feel it. It isn't about what you feel. It's about what you believe and what you know. Don't go by feelings. Listen, don't get hooked on an experience. I don't know if I got time for that. Don't get hooked on an experience. Well, how was church today? How was worship today? Who gave you authority to grade worship? Because we base, we base how was worship based on our experience. Well, sometimes God won't always give you an experience. He'll just give you prayer and a word, and that's still enough because the anointing of God's all over it. So don't get hooked on the experience. Well, I, 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 that church is dead. I didn't feel God. No, maybe you're dead. I'm not afraid. I'm preaching the fundamentals of walking with Jesus with you. Why? Because I want you to be successful in the kingdom of God. If you're successful, his kingdom will advance. The key to the anointing is this. Is keep yourself close to God. Everyone in Scripture that got close to Jesus and wanted to change was changed. Everyone. A woman with the issue of blood. Blind Barnabas. The lame man at the gate. Remember how I told you that one of the meaning of the words anoint means to rub in? Just be close enough to Jesus to where it rubs off. I know you do. Woman with the issue of blood, surrounded by thousands of people. And all at once she reached out. If I could just touch the hem of his garment. I'd be whole. And all at once, Jesus felt the power, the anointing, my Lord, flow out of him. And he looked at his side, who touched me? They laughed. What? What do you mean who touched you? Look at all these thousands of people. No, there may be thousands around me pressing up against me, but only one touched me. The key to the anointing is keeping yourself close enough to Jesus to where he rubs off. Jesus Christ, the anointed one. The one that saves, the one that heals, the one that delivers, the one that sets free is here today to do what needs to be done in your life. Whether it's salvation, deliverance, healing, provision, whatever it is, make sure you put yourself in a place today that he can rub off into your life. It'll only happen when you get yourself close to him. If you have a need, you come now. You desire a greater degree of anointing on your life, get around this altar and pray. If you want salvation, come and pray. If you need healing, you come and pray. If you could just thank God for his anointing already on your life, come and pray. Whatever it is, you come now. To break the yoke and lift the head some the prayer team and some uh, staff members come and up around these people and just pray over them as the, as the Lord's direction. Just come and pray over them. Hey. 
down the burdens you have carried for in this sanctuary God For in this sanctuary, God is here. Let me remind you of something this morning. The anointing is for you. It's for you. The anointing is for the teacher parent, the mother, the father, the student, the child, the son, daughter, the lawyer, the doctor, the pilot. I can assure you, Thursday night when we're flying in there like a duck getting ready to land, I'm praying the anointing of God. Now you hear me now. I'm praying the anointing of God touches the air traffic controllers, the flight crew, the pilot, and the co-pilots. May their hands be anointed. May their feet be anointed. May their mind be quickened. May all outside activity be cleared from their mind. And may this flight pattern be their primary focus. Why? Because sometimes it's that crucial. There's been many times I pray that the anointing of God touch people. Uh, as I go into surgery, other people go into surgery, I pray for the surgeons, the doctors, the anesthesiologists, the nurses, the whole crew, that the right, the right team would be assembled around that person. Why? Because it's important. And I have the authority. I have the privilege of a child of Jesus Christ. I have the authority and the privilege of praying that anointing on those hands and minds. This morning we're coming in. We got a lot more snow in the valley than, than what uh, they got here, at least early on. And we're, we're, we're coming over Poplar Fork. And somebody said, why do you take Poplar Fork? Because it's a challenge. <laughs> Roads are bad. It's a challenge to come over Poplar Fork. So I'm coming over Poplar Fork, and we get onto Route 60. And as we go into to a turn, there was a car in front of us that went around that turn, and the back in the car slid sideways. And they turn into a NASCAR driver. I could see him, man. They're just whipping that thing around, and it comes back around the other way, and it slides the other way, and just barely misses the guardrail. First thing I said, Jesus, touch him. Help him, Jesus. Anoint him. Jesus, keep him between the guardrail. I mean, I, you can ask my wife. I'm praying, and I'm telling you, they never hit a thing. Now, their heartbeat was about to, to but, but, uh, you know, they, they were a little stirred up. So South Carolina. Thinking, oh, yeah, they don't know much about snow in South Carolina. 
but you have the authority as a child of God. You carry it everywhere you go. Don't just sit on it or use it for yourself. Use it in your fear, your, in your sphere of influence. Your influence is everywhere you are. Father, may you bless your sons and daughters. May they truly recognize who they are. Father, I pray that you would meet every need in the house, physical, spiritual, financial, and emotional. And Father, may darkness be driven back and your marvelous light come. We thank you for it. And we ask it in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen.